Hello, Okemo Valley. This is Carol Lighthall with Okemo Valley Chamber of Commerce, our, our monthly uh, update show. Thanks for joining in. Today we're talking, and, and I want to say this is a fun group. Um, we'll be all serious for the program, but uh, they're a lot of fun. So I'm talking with two people from Black River Independent School, a developing school here in Ludlow. Um, and there's a lot of buzz around it. And so I have um, Megan Jenkins, and people may know Megan from around the area, um, and Sean Williams. And so um, I thought it would make sense in case you uh, haven't learned about the school in the past to just start from the beginning um, in terms of uh, welcome to the two of you. Thanks for joining in. Thank I you. I appreciate Thank it. You. Um, let's talk about what is Black River Independent School. How did it, how did it get started? The, the idea for the school started a few years ago. As many people are aware, the Black River High School, the current public high school, will be closing. Uh, at the end of this school year, so in June 2020. And that is part of a statewide consolidation effort, um, as folks have heard about, through Act 46, in which many smaller high schools are closing and students are given the option in that case of going to any other public high school or any accredited independent school. In some cases, those are far away. Um, in this case, the options are Green Mountain High School or Mill River High School or other independent schools. So students in Ludlow and Mount Holly that currently attend Black River Middle and High School will now have all those options. They'll have school choice. Um, and a lot of other towns already function that way. Yes. The idea for an independent school is to, to keep a school here in Ludlow, most likely using the existing high school building, which is available. And Beautiful building, by the way. Yeah, yes. really a shame to let that building mm -hmm. not have a future. And the... The other exciting part of the, having a school is we can build this school from the ground up and make it whatever we want. Yes. Uh, it is an independent yes. school, so there's a lot of freedom. Yes. So we're excited about building a school that comes from the community, that's what the community wants, and that is designed for this place, for these students, and that, it, that will be a draw, actually, because the school will also be able to accept students from other towns that also have school choice mm -hmm. um, using the state's tuition dollars. So any student with school choice will be able to come without paying all of the tuition that will come from the state, uh, just as if they went to a public high school. And so clarify a little bit uh, for me and maybe for our audience, the difference between an independent school, a public school, a private school, and where Black River Independent School fits into that. I would put it like this. A public school is a, that's the same in Vermont as anywhere in the country. They're run by local towns or communities, counties, cities, um, all under the direction of the state and of the federal government, ultimately. They have, uh, at this point in history, relatively rigorous standards that they have to meet, and they have to do a lot of things a certain way. Um, and they're all funded with public money. So students don't pay tuition to go to a public school. Free public education started in the United States. I don't know the exact date, but it was in the late 1800s, um, a long time ago. And it's part of the philosophy of a democratic nation that we provide education to all students, not just to the wealthy. Private schools, which is a term that we don't hear so often here in Vermont, um, are funded by, essentially by tuition. So students coming have to find the money, whatever the student needs to charge. Uh, in some cases, that's really for the economically elite, uh, although sometimes they often have scholarships so they can invite um, students from other backgrounds as well. In Vermont, we typically use the term independent school, which means that the school runs independently of the, of the larger school structure, process, um, town, state, et cetera, uh, under its own direction. And as an independent school in Vermont, since we have so many small towns that aren't able to run their own middle and high schools, you need a certain number of students to do that, uh, the independent schools play a role in the public system because students in those towns can go to the independent schools. Yes, great. <clears throat> Would you add anything to that, Megan? Yeah, I think it's uh, independent schools are basically, you know, in Vermont what we have is almost like a voucher system is starting to come, if you can understand that. So it's like the tuition money that you could get if your town is a sending school gives you, 
whatever the state determines, so for us it's about $16,000, you can take that, that and go to whatever school you want. And our independent school would be able to take that money and then we would have our own school board and we have our own control. So we would not operate under the Two Rivers Supervisory Union, we would be our own. And you know, I think that's important and exciting to think about is sort of reclaiming in uh, the independent school model. And one thing that is important to us as we've been evolving this idea is that we want this school to serve the community. When you talk about private schools, sometimes it sounds elitist and only for you know very wealthy. We know that this town is run by locals who work very hard, and not everyone has access to um, you know incredible wealth. And we want to make sure that this school is serving everyone, but providing opportunities that other private schools do as well which we're able to do better because of the model of a private school. So it's kind of like a hybrid between a public and maybe a private school, a flexible school education model, mm -hmm. a local education model. Sounds really, um, really exciting. Um, one thing, Megan, you and I um, had a conversation early on um, about the, the school, and I think that you recognize that people in the community were um, a little bit sad at the school closing. And, and tell, tell, um, tell everybody um, how you framed it. Do you remember what you said to me, that, that you see the school closing in a way, sad, yes, on one hand, but on the other, it's a really big, exciting opportunity. Yeah, and it is. And that's where, you know, I'm coming in as a parent of young kids. I graduated Black River High School, and I feel that sadness. I, I do, but I also see an opportunity, and I think everyone in the town needs to embrace and celebrate this, because we have a really exciting opportunity to create something new, unique, and and provide an even better, much better education for the people in our town and to try and sort of celebrate and continue uh, the models of our community that we've had. You know, I grew up, I was in Mount Holly and then there's Ludlow, you know, I'm bringing my kids to practice, soccer practice in Ludlow. Like, I don't want this sort of community to divide up and disperse. It's gonna be harder to attract families to wanna move here if we don't embrace this really unique opportunity to create something very exciting and important, I think, for the future of the town. And the, you know, the <clears throat> starting, I think, with, the, with some initiatives the governor is involved in, uh, there's a lot of recognition throughout the state uh, that population decline is a problem here in yeah. Vermont, and especially for, I think, working people, families, Families represent communities, um, children uh, going to school, soccer practice, whatever it is, um, those things are so important. Um, and so that connection is, is really critical. Would you talk a little bit about who's involved? And I think, um, did this group just start this year or when did it start? How did it start, if you would? The group started formally in 2017. That's when the Black River Independent School Committee was formed uh, as a legal organization. Um, it was small at the beginning because at the time the school closure wasn't even certain yet. Um, it was a potential for the future. And then uh, the group's activity increased this year as the need to start the new school is becoming a very clear reality. So I would say now the, the school has a really strong group working really hard. At, at the beginning it was one weekly meeting, maybe a few phone calls. Now we still have the one weekly meeting, but there is constant email messaging. We're using an online messaging system called Slack, uh, just like big Silicon Valley companies, yeah, to great. communicate and work together. Yeah, we're quite forward thinking yeah. in, that, in that regard. <laughs> and we're running multi, many events. We've had two events in the past two weeks. We have a board of 10, yes. who's the voting members who make the, the big decisions about the school's future. We also have a committee that's a little bit larger, which has been rotating over time. People come in, people come out, people come occasionally all interested members of the community. There's uh, there's parents, there's current teachers. There's We've had now quite a few educators uh, who have experience outside the local education system from other states, from alternative education systems, which I think is a really big strength to us being able to create an innovative program that is really grounded in cutting edge, modern, 
creative ways of doing education, uh, which is being done in a lot of places around the country and which we can have here too. And what kind of, is it, is it fair to ask you about the models you've looked at? I know that's not one of the questions we yeah, talked fine, about. Yeah. yeah, we could talk about it a little bit. Um, yeah, so we've been really um, excited and interested in the idea of expeditionary learning and the idea of looking at learning as an adventure. And it's a very successful model that's being embraced by charter schools that are quite successful um, in DC and across the country. We also have a lot of, um, we have a lot of people on our community, such as Sean, who has a, a background with Knowles uh, and outdoor leadership programs. And we think that in this area, uh, especially, it would be really exciting to bring in these, this sort of outdoor component to our school. And maybe you want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure, I can talk a little bit about, a little more about expeditionary education and the, the philosophy behind that. It might seem a little strange to say, well, what's an expedition maybe you think of I don't know, an expedition to the North Pole or some big trip in the mountains, what does that have to do with going to high school? Uh, that's a great question. The idea is, uh, is to think of students working together in a school, like in one classroom or in one activity together, as coming together towards a goal and all working together through a process with a shared goal in mind, where there's a little bit of adventure to it. So they're not just coming to consume a product which their teacher is giving them, of whatever they're supposed to learn that, let's be honest, not every student really wants to learn everything they're being offered all the time, mm -hmm. um, but engaged in some sort of long-term goal together. And there's a lot of ways that can look different in different subjects and different activities. Say, if you have a history class, maybe the idea isn't just to follow a list of various topics in US history. Maybe the idea is to go through US history, but with one overarching theme or goal in mind. So you're learning about the whole history of the United States, sure. But you're focusing on this one theme that your teacher has picked out for the year, or maybe the students have picked out, um, and unifying everything you're doing behind that. Mm -hmm. um, so, Very interesting. Yeah. It, um, it, it reminds me, and I don't know if this is an educational kind of term, but kind of a whole person uh, learning. Um, and so the, you know, bringing in the, the outdoors kind of, and, and how that opens uh, a different way of learning, I would imagine. And, and keeping it interesting. Yeah. yeah, and we and you know, we really want to make this the education in Ludlow exciting again. It's been you know, it's really important that people are excited and proud of, you know, the learning process and everything that's going on around the school. And that is really our goal to make this a fun, exciting project that we can all as a community embrace and make sure it happens and make sure that we can start drawing families here and our school can be sort of a beacon to the families of why Ludlow is so awesome. Like, why do you love Ludlow? Because you want to be here. You want to send your kids to school here. That's our dream, you know? Well, and you know, um, our chamber, so Kimo Valley Chamber represents 12 communities. Um, but I'll tell you, education is uh, just is such an important factor in people's minds, I think. Vermont lifestyle appeals to a lot of people. Um, say in some metropolitan area, they're thinking very fondly of Vermont. And sometimes the question is whether the resources uh, for their family are available. And so to be able to say yes, yes, there is a very strong education component here in Ludlow is such a draw, as you yeah. say. And so if it's, if it's drawing in families, it's also drawing in employees. Yes. It's drawing in potential business owners, uh, that kind of thing. Um, what other, uh, what other uh, benefits do you see um, the school providing the community and the communities it serves. Yeah, well, I think, you know, as a basic, just it's going to be, you know, when the high school, not to say a negative way, but when the high school closes, you know, if we were not to open, families who are choosing where to move are going to have a hard time choosing this community. It's not going to be as attractive. But if they, once we do open our doors, coming here is going to be very attractive. And then all the local businesses, you know, where I'm running to go take the kids soccer, I'm going to go eat at Mojo's or I'm going to go grab a pizza at Goodman's. You know, it's going to 
it, all those side impacts are really important and our community will definitely feel the impact of that as we bring in more families and bringing in families that are excited about education is going to help the community in so many ways. These are the families we want here who are ready to get engaged and serve on committees and you know, create new economic opportunities. I think it's, and then we can maybe, not maybe, we could definitely get more people to stay here instead of going to college and then leaving and feeling like they should stay, you know, in a city. If we can provide more draw to the town for young families, I think that would be amazing. Fabulous. Yeah, Anything I, else, Sean? I think we should just make it really clear that that should have a big economic impact for businesses. Yeah. Because we're talking about drawing people to live here, keeping people that are already here, having more consumers for businesses to, to benefit from in a really clear way, and also having more people who are willing to live here and work here. It can, it can be many hard, hard for many business owners to attract people to come. Yes. Um, in a lot of different, a lot of different fields, from, uh, from Vail attracting managers from its far-flung operations who it needs to now live and work in Ludlow, um, to, to tradespeople who can perhaps find, a, find an easier place to live elsewhere, although there's plenty of work for them here. Yeah, and just, I think, in, in general, it adds to the, um, to the richness of the community to have uh, families in the area who are rolling up their sleeve yeah. And kind of getting it done, whatever it is, whether it's a new, uh, a new playground, um, uh, just the positive energy yeah. that it creates is huge. And the, the leveraging um, in the economy, uh, you know, is probably pretty hard to measure. But I think it's, uh, I think you're exactly right. Um, Throw my glasses on for, for a moment. Um, and so we talked about who's involved in uh, backgrounds. Um, and so where would students usually come from? Would they be from families here in Ludlow? We expect the first year um, to primarily be Mount Holly and Ludlow families. And then Ideally, in the next years, as we grow and our reputation grows, we could attract families from everywhere. We could attract parents who currently send their kids to OMS, and we could be ascending school to OMS as well. We can attract um, second homeowners who may want to be up here full time more. And we can also we could also take. Uh, we do think Weston is a primary target area for us because we will be with closer to the, them than the schools they're currently sending their students to. And so any school that's a choice town, we could take their students in. Ideally, any student in Vermont or the country or the world who will want to come to our school. Yeah, fabulous. And that um, pending successful fundraising in the future, we could offer scholarships yeah. to students from local communities who do not have school choice so that they would not have to fund that tuition, which if their school doesn't have school, school choice, unfortunately, the state wouldn't fund. Yeah, and I, it seems like the lo local education, we talked about uh, it being a sad thing to have the school closed. I think it's equally sad to think of families needing to travel to distant locations for education. Um, and then you figure outside curricular activities are less likely because the mm -hmm. logistics of that have to be a nightmare. I am. Um, exactly. I grew up in the Northeast Kingdom and rode on bus a uh, half hour to 45 minutes to school, and I just I know that kind of education plus the burden it puts on the family mm -hmm. yeah. to have to provide that transportation and this you know it has to affect learning. I would say as well, family life, learning. Yeah. A question based on uh, on something we we covered. So a question, and, and maybe this is related to an independent school, but my uh, observation is with education that education today that sometimes the requirements of education seem to get in the way of true learning. Um, does an independent school, um, 
it, does it have flexibility around requirements of, that a public school would have? How would that work? And I know I'm not being awfully specific, but maybe you understand my point. I, th I think I do, and, it's, uh, and the answer is no. An independent school does not have the same requirements in terms of exactly what the courses should look like, um, what, what different elements the student has to have. Uh, what an independent school does have to, to have is have its students pass standardized tests at the end of the year. Yes. Uh, just like a public school. But the student's ability to pass those can come from anywhere. Yes. Um, so as long as the, the education they're getting is providing them with that, that information and those test taking skills, um, then the independent school can have whatever classes it sees as it sees fit. Fabulous. Can we talk about milestones and what's needed to establish the school going forward? Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot is happening and has happened. You know, the sort of start was that the board, you know, they've created a 501c3. They were a nonprofit. They began initial fundraising, outreach, and grew, grew the board to what it is now. And now we have just hired a development coordinator and that's really helpful and we're really excited about her. She has experience with national outreach campaigns with NPR and ABC and then the other big component is the school itself and so uh, at the last select board meeting the uh, select board voted to bring it to the uptown vote to buy the building. The town itself would buy the building for a dollar. Um, there will be a public information meeting before the vote, and that would happen um, at the end of October. And then in the first week of November, there'll be a special election where uh, the voters will be able to vote to, for the town to buy the building. And once the town buys the building, it would then be uh, leasing to us the top two floors for us to use. And they're very supportive of wanting us to be there, and we are very appreciative of all the support. Um, from them and so that's kind of like the real big thing the other big component is the uh, state process we have a meeting uh, with the Department of Education Logan Nicole has helped us get this you know sit down so we can be sure where all our docs are in a row and that's October 2nd and so that's wow. those are um, those are our really big things right now and then we also at the same time are trying to uh, do outreach and fundraising, and that's a huge part too because we need to prove our financial viability to open to the state. And so, part of doing that is us doing things like this, uh, joining the chamber and reaching out to the community members. And we're having an event, uh, as you know, to celebrate our membership with the chamber October 11th at Du Jour. That's a great time uh, to come hear what we have to say and our progress. And uh, yeah, I think those are a lot of the main uh, milestones we've reached thus far. Do you have any more that I might have missed? Uh, no, I think that's pretty good. Pretty good to sum up. It's been a lot of work thus far. We're proud of where we've yeah. come. I, you know, I would thank you for joining the chamber. I think that the school is a really important um, issue, uh, opportunity uh, for Ludlow, for the area. For the business members we serve, thank you for being a member. Um, it sounds like you have this event, certainly, and we'll be there. So come <laughs> join it. Um, bring your questions. Bring your suggestions. Sounds like a really uh, a good time. Um, and then, and you have others planned as well, or in planning? Yes, yes. We're trying to start planning, you know, a monthly or so event where we can get community members to come and, you know, engage with us, and we can try and find fun ways to sort of make sure everyone knows what's happening. We also do meet weekly at uh, 6.30 in the library at the high school, and we welcome community involvement. Uh, people can stay up to date on our events and what's happening by going to our website or our Facebook page. And yeah. so that's Fabulous. a good way to. And you know, and I would say, just in general, I understand that the human human beings tend to want to um, be conservative at a time like this when there's a new project. Uh, and they have a wait and see kind of attitude. And maybe a better approach in this situation would be to be informed, get your questions answered. Um, 
Uh, we have some uh, people. That this board is working very hard to uh, do take the right steps, and it's about all of us. Uh, sometimes there's issues around funding. You know, how will it affect town people? Um, that kind of thing. Is that anything uh, that that you can comment on? Um. Well, I, I would say, you know, I do feel that a lot of people have this sort of, they're waiting to see how we do till they want to jump in. And we want everyone to jump in now and ask us the questions. You know, yes. we're work, I'm working so hard for no pay on this. Please yes. ask me questions. Like, I'm not, you know, I don't want to waste anyone's time either. And we're here to do that. So we really need the involvement and the leadership from the community. And However we can get that, like we welcome it. We really do. Yes. We are open to critique and to advice and to how is the best way to move forward. We really want that input. And so t uh, talk a little bit about the role of fundraising in the project. Yeah, so right now we are really focused on getting our startup money. I mean, it costs money to hire a head of school and pay them, to hire our development person mm -hmm. to... Um, pay for a grant writer. There are lots of things that cost money in the development of a school. And so we believe the first part is we'd like, we need $200,000 in startup funds. And we have a larger goal of getting $800,000 to help for reserve funds. So that way that would represent 25% of our two year budget. And fundraising at this point is crucially important that we need some people or a lot of people in small and big ways, however can, to help us to help show the commitment of the community in our in us being viable to the state. So the state needs to know that we are financially viable to open the doors. And that's why fundraising is, you know, basically so important. We we just we need it. Well, and I, I want to congratulate you again, um, just from the standpoint of uh, in one of the discussions we had about fundraising and uh, development, and I said, oh, there's this, this woman, she's considered the Cadillac of uh, fund development. Yeah. And um, and then you told me later who you had hired, and I said that's her. <laughs> yeah. So you're you're definitely um, you you have someone good in your corner, yeah. um, and so that's important uh, resources being added to the fundraising effort. And it it sounds like what I've heard a lot from you is that you really want to engage people, you want to yeah. inform people, that kind of thing, which is probably as important. I would, I would yeah. say, in my opinion. No, it really is. We need to engage the community on all levels and just you know, make sure that we're keeping everyone informed. Or if there's ways mm -hmm. you think we can do something better or that you would you know, and like us to come to you know, your business or your house. And you know, we need to make sure that we're keeping the community involved in this project. I'm just checking my notes to see what else we want to, um, want to cover. Have we, have we covered the main points? Are there other things we should be talking about today? I feel like we kind of hit them. Do you, is there something you want to talk about? I think we could say a little more about the, the curriculum. And okay. the, yeah. just to give yeah. people yeah. a vision of what it'll yeah. look like to go to this school for a student. Yes. And how will it look different from a public school? Yeah. Yes. Um, because realistically, we'll be competing for students with, other, with public schools. Yes. Um, they'll be choosing whether to go to a public school that's a little bit far away or to come to our independent school here. So we have gone into this with a really high level of intention and care. Uh, because as I said, we're doing it from the ground up. So we can make it what, the way we think is best. Um, and it's a big responsibility. So we've, we've established six pillars that are going to be the, the, the absolute foundation of, of everything we're doing with our students' education. So all the curriculum, all the classes, all the programming, and the students' experience going to school, working together, working with the faculty, are all based on these six pillars. Those are a global breadth of perspective. We want to provide our students from a small town in a rural area with a real perspective on the whole world. So they feel like they can go from Ludlow or Mount Holly or Weston or any other small Vermont town to anywhere and feel comfortable. Um, another one is democratic participation and justice. I talked a little bit about how democracy, public school is part of democracy. And we want our students to not just be learning about democracy as an idea that they might deal with as an adult someday when they vote, but actually to be living it at school. 
We are thinking about ways where students' voices will be heard and how the school is run, meaningful ways, uh, where students will have really lived a democratic experience so that when they turn 18 and are asked to participate at the local, the state, and national levels, they'll, they'll really feel what that means. Um, another one is environmental stewardship. We would like students to come away with just a real sense in their bones that they are responsible for this place we live, that they understand how the place interacts with the people that live here, and all the different environmental politics and sciences and decisions that go on. Uh, we want students really engaged with that uh, on a daily basis. Um, so they might learn about things in their classes. They also might eat food at lunch that is grown by local farmers or grown in the, in the community garden at the school and prepared by each other. Um, working to prepare lunch rather than by like a team of chefs. Great. Uh, the next one is outdoor adventure. We talked mm -hmm. about this a little bit already. So in addition to this expeditionary model, we're excited to have students actually going out into the mountains uh, and on the lakes and having adventures in groups working together and really learning to, to support each other, to believe in themselves, um, and to, to work pretty closely together with their peers in a way that that we think that outdoor experience really provides like nothing else. So that'll be something for everyone at the school, not just an, an option or, or a fun side, um, side note. Uh, and then personal action is another one. We want students to feel empowered and able, capable themselves to take on whatever they need to. So to do that, we're going to have students actually have responsibilities in the school to do more than just their homework. Um, we're going to have them, as I said, involved in decision making, maybe involved in caring for the place, involved in food preparation, involved in these outdoor trips. Uh, and then our last one, maybe you want to talk a little bit about the last one, Megan. Yeah, so we, our last one is uh, community engagement. And we really um, feel strongly about a uh, real strength of this community is the way people come out and they just do things together. You know, we don't just sit back and wait for someone to come build us, uh, you know, a new playground or these things. In a small community, you have to work together. And we want to foster that uh, throughout the school. We want to provide opportunities for our students to be able to, you know, participate in things that are happening in the town, to make real changes for the town. And also, two more things I, is we are really committed to making sure that we have a really vital art and music program. And that is really goes throughout all of our pillars is to provide a lot of opportunities for creative success. And um, yeah, and also we're, this is a question that gets asked a lot, I think I should answer here, is that, that we will work with vo the vocational tech schools. And we also can sort of go beyond that. And we really want to foster apprenticeships with local businesses. That's something that's very important to us and to the way we've uh, designed the school and we think to a lot of people in the community. So, you know, if someone's path is to become, you know, a trade, you know, in the trades, which is an excellent career um, mm -hmm. to be in and there's a high need, we can really help foster that path in our school. Yes. Excellent. And it, it sounds like with the pillars and that, that you talked about, which to me sounds like uh, Vermont living at its best, really, yeah. you know, um, I think that's uh, really incredible. But it, it ensures that you're, um, you're teaching kids not just the alphabet and the, the numbers, yeah. but you're, you're enriching their life for, for, their, for the rest of their life. Um, and just really uh, engaging the student. And it seems like in situations that you, like this, it's kind of um, in Vermont, we're, we're you know, trying to figure out how to have students want to stay in Vermont. And it seems like sometimes, uh, like my mother did for me, is to encourage to go uh, experience the world. Yeah and then have the students decide what works best for them. For me and for a lot of other people coming back to Vermont is mm -hmm. just you know, the, the right answer. So this is all, all very good. Are there other points we need to cover? I think we've done pretty good. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, thank <laughs> you, thank you. I'm, you know, I'm excited 
um, excited to help out, be part of part of what needs to happen. Um, I hope the the communities, uh, parents, whatever, find a way to support that. And it doesn't always mean that you just give your rubber stamp. That you participate, you ask the questions, find out how you can help, um, and uh, and enhance kind of life quality of life uh, in Ludlow in the area. Uh, for do you go by the uh, by an acronym or is it Black River Independent School? Black, Black River yeah. Independent School. Yeah. yeah. So it feels like a celebration to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for that. Thank you for being here and stay tuned. Uh, you'll I'm sure you'll be hearing uh, from these folks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.